Chapter Twenty Two of Margaret of Anjou. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Margaret of Anjou by Jacob Abbott. Chapter Twenty Two: Bitter Disappointment. The preparations which were required for Margaret and her company to return to England in suitable state seem to have consumed several months for although it was as early as november that the great entrance into paris took place and the news of henry's restoration was received it was not until february that the royal party were ready to embark there were negotiations to be made and men to be enlisted and ships to be procured and funds to be provided and appointments to be decided upon and dresses to be made and a thousand questions of precedence and etiquette to be considered and arranged at length however all was ready and the whole company proceeded together to the port which had been selected as the place of embarkation this port was arfleur arfleur is situated on the coast of normandy near the more modern port of havre when the time arrived for sailing the weather looked very unfavourable but margaret who had become weary with the delays by which her return had been so long postponed and was very impatient to arrive in her own dominions again ordered the ships to put to sea three times did they make the attempt and three times were the ships driven back into port again many of her friends were greatly discouraged by these failures some said they thought that this continued resistance of the elements to her plans ought to be regarded as an indication of divine providence and that she was not to go to england at present and they begged her to defer the attempt others thought that the contrary winds were raised by witches and they began to devise measures for finding out who the witches were margaret paid no attention to either of these suggestions but persisted in her determination to sail the moment that the weather should allow this delay was a source of great inconvenience to her and it occasioned a good deal of expense for besides her own personal officers and attendants margaret had collected quite a large body of soldiers to cross the channel with her in order to reinforce the armies of warwick and of henry this was quite necessary for although henry had been nominally restored to the throne his enemies were yet in the field in considerable force and margaret was very desirous of bringing with her the means of helping to put them down indeed she knew that the situation of her husband was extremely precarious and that the fortune of war might at any time turn against him and this consideration made her extremely impatient at the delay occasioned by the weather at arfleur she did not know but that the king might even then be engaged in close conflict with his foes and likely to be overwhelmed by them and that her force by being so long delayed would arrive too late to save him alas for poor margaret it was indeed exactly so it was not until the twenty fourth of march that it was possible to leave the port but then although the weather was by no means settled the queen determined to wait no longer the countess of warwick who had been left in france when the earl her husband went to england sailed from arfleur at the same time with the queen though in a different vessel her daughter however the prince regent's bride-elect went with the queen the weather continued very boisterous after the fleet sailed and as the gales which blew so heavily were from the north the ships could make very little progress they were kept beating about in the channel or lying at anchor waiting for a change of wind for more than a fortnight during all this time margaret was kept in a perfect fever of impatience and anxiety at length about the tenth of april they reached the land at weymouth after the ships entered the port the space of a day or two was occupied in making preparations to land among these preparations was included the work of arranging apartments at an abbey in the vicinity of weymouth to receive the queen and her attendants in the meantime the landing of the troops was pushed forward as rapidly as possible the ship in which the countess of warwick embarked had sailed in a different direction from margaret's fleet and it was not known yet what had become of her when at last the preparations were completed the queen and her party went on shore and took up their abode in the abbey margaret's mind was intensely occupied with the arrangements necessary for marshalling her troops and getting them ready to march to the assistance of warwick when to her amazement and consternation she received news on the very next day after she took up her abode in the abbey that the party of king edward had mustered in great force and advanced toward london and that a battle had been fought at a place called barnet a few miles from london in which edward's party had been completely victorious the earl of warwick had been killed king henry her husband had been taken prisoner and their cause seemed to be wholly lost warwick had gone into the battle on foot in order the more effectually to stimulate the emulation of his men so that when in the end his forces were defeated and fled he himself being encumbered by his armour could not save himself but was overtaken by his remorseless enemies and slain the terrible agitation and anguish that this news excited in the mind of the queen it would be impossible to describe 
She fell at first into a swoon, and when at length her senses returned, she was so completely overwhelmed with disappointment, vexation, and rage, and talked so wildly and incoherently, that her friends almost feared that she would lose her reason. Her son, the young prince, who was now nearly nineteen years of age, did all in his power to soothe and calm her, and at length so far succeeded as to induce her to consider what was to be done to secure her own and his safety. To remain where they were was to expose themselves to be attacked at any time by a body of Edward's victorious troops, and conveyed prisoner to the tower. There was another abbey at not a great distance from where Margaret now was, which was endowed with certain privileges as a sanctuary, such that persons seeking refuge there under certain circumstances could not be taken away. The name of this retreat was Beaulieu Abbey. Margaret immediately proceeded across the country to this place, taking with her the prince and nearly all the others of her party either on her arrival here or on the way she met the countess of warwick who it will be recollected had left arfleur at the same time that she did the countess's ship had been driven farther to the eastward and she had finally landed at portsmouth here she too had learned the news of the battle of barnet and of the death of her husband and being completely overwhelmed with the tidings and also alarmed for her own safety she had determined to fly for refuge to beaulieu abbey too the two unhappy ladies who had parted three weeks before on the coast of france with such high and excellent expectations, now met, both plunged in the deepest and most overwhelming sorrow. Their hopes were blasted, all their bright prospects were destroyed, and they found themselves in the condition of helpless and wretched fugitives, dependent upon a religious sanctuary for the hope of even saving their lives. End of chapter 22